Hi everyone, welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel. I have a very, very special guest with me, Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder of Skybridge Capital and Salt Conference. Anthony, it's great to be speaking with you today. I got my crypto, I got my crypto branding going here, Tom. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Good to be on. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, it's an honor to be speaking with you. I'm a big fan of your work, and I thought we could start with your background. Where did you grow up, and what did you want to be when you when you were growing up? Well, you know, when I was eight, seven, eight, they were landing people on the moon, so I was a hundred percent confident that I was going to be an astronaut. <laughs> I really wanted to be an astronaut with my second grade class, so I knew more about the moon back then. Uh, than you could possibly imagine. I was like Dexter's Laboratory and a big time Jimmy Neutron nerd about the moon when I was a kid. But yeah, you know, then you get older, you're like, okay, I got to make money. So my original idea was to become a lawyer because they were paying lawyers. The starting salary for lawyers when I came out of school was $65,000 a year. That was like double what my dad was making. So I was like, all right, my dad was a laborer. Then he became a, a crane engineer or a crane operator, uh, 42 years of the same company. And I'm like, okay, man, if they're going to pay lawyers first year, 65 grand, my dad's making like 33, that's what I'm going to do. So that was my very naive two dimensional thought process on career planning. So I applied to seven schools. I got rejected from Yale. I got accepted to Harvard and several other schools. And so I ended up going to Harvard. And uh, now I'm at law school hating it. <laughs> not that law school is not a bad place or anything like that. It's just like, it was like, there's no way I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm like bored out of my mind. So I crossed the river. The Harvard Business School was recruiting. Uh, you know, companies were recruiting over there. McKinsey, Goldman Sachs. I mean, I'm taking you back 33 years ago. And so sure. I went into my Goldman Sachs interview, Tony. I had 100% polyester on. I had a <laughs> polyester black Guido suit. I had a polyester shirt and tie. And I had these like Capizio dance shoes that we called cockroach killers, okay, back in the early 80s. My hair was blown back like Tony Minero in Saturday Night Fever. Yeah. <laughs> and I walked in there and I was talking about the TED spread and interest rate valuation metrics and uh, macroeconomics. And the Goldman partner looked at me. There was a woman in there with him. He says, okay, can I, can I see you for a second? I said, yes, sir. He said, yeah, yeah, well, step outside, step outside. I said, yes, sir. He puts his arm around me and goes, okay, kid, let me tell you, you're a smart kid. You're the worst dressed person that we've ever met. <laughs> okay, and literally I was like fully flammable for my first job interview. So he's like, look, you gotta go buy yourself a suit. It's gotta be natural fibers. You gotta have a cotton shirt. I mean, you look like shit. And if you don't do it, you're not gonna be able to get this job. So I'm gonna invite you back to Goldman, but you gotta dress appropriately for it. So it was a rite of passage story for me. You know, I was a blue collar kid, never saw the inside of a country club, never hit a golf ball, never hit a tennis ball. And so I was very grateful to Goldman for picking me up, taking me in. Uh, and it was a big maturation process. I got fired from Goldman 18 months after I arrived there. And then two months after my firing, I got rehired into Goldman. Hmm. So you thought my first firing was at the White House. See, I, I've been fired before. I mean, I'll probably be fired again. You know what I mean? But uh, that's my story. Wow. So it sounds like I you got into finance because it was paying more money than sure. being aware. I would like to tell you that it was some esoteric, I'm living my dream sort of bullshit. That is not the case. I needed to pay back the several hundred thousand dollars of school debt that I had. Uh, but I do love finance. It turned out that I got very lucky. I did it for expedient reasons and monetary reasons, but uh, it has become a labor of love over the, over the years. Sure. So it sounds like you cut your teeth at Goldman and then you grew from there. You went Lehman Brothers and you have now a plethora of, of finance experience and you started Skybridge Capital. Uh, how did that yeah, idea so come about? Let me about? give you 30 more seconds. Then. So I left Goldman after seven years. I was fired once in that period of time, rehired, but I was there effectively for seven years. And then I went to uh, start my own company. I had my own business for five years. I sold it to Newberger Berman. Hmm. Newberger got bought by Lehman. So that's how I ended up at Lehman. Ah. I fulfilled my contract at Lehman and left in 05, March of 2005 to start Skybridge. Uh, so Skybridge will be celebrating its 16th anniversary, March 7th 
of 2021. So that's my whole odyssey to where we are right now. Wow. Uh, congratulations on the 16th anniversary. And I mean, let me put it this way. I'm there 16 years less my 11 day fiasco in the White House. OK, <laughs> so, you know, but what are you going to do? 33 sure. years, 33 years in finance minus 11 days. So let's talk a little bit around, you know, at the time at your White House, at the White House, excuse me. Um, and would you see yourself uh, in politics again in the future? Well, I don't want to say 100 percent no, because anything can happen. I'm not a politician. Like, I hate these politicians that say, oh, I'm never going to run for all. Like Elizabeth Warren, three weeks or a month before she announced her presidency or candidacy for the presidency, I'm not running for president. And then she runs for president. I mean, these people are a bunch of, you know, hypocrites, sycophants and liars. Right. So I'm not any of those things. I'll tell you exactly how I feel. And so maybe we'll have to see. You know, I, I don't have a party that I live in right now. I'm a center right guy. I'm not a Trumplican. I'm not a sure. Trumpist. I think he's got to screw loose. And I think he hijacked the party and turns it into a personality cult. I'm not a Democrat. I don't think we can go hard left on these issues. We have to heal the society. We have to make society better for middle and lower income people. We have to create a platform of equal opportunity. But I'm not about equal outcomes. Sure. I think that would be a disaster for our society. I want you to get very rich off of your industry and your ideas and your creativity. And that's really what we want in our societies is people to be ambitious and to, you know, grow the pie through their ingenuity. But you have to uncap their upside in order for them to be able to be motivated to do that. Sure. Um, well, I would love to see you. Uh, in some way, somehow, because you are a New Yorker, to be involved, maybe someday mayor, local government wise, that would be cool. I live out of Long Island. I couldn't be mayor. I mean, I could run for governor, but I can't run against Andrew Cuomo. Number one, he would kick my ass in. But number two, he's a family friend. We go back a long time. And so I don't think he would appreciate me running against him. And I wouldn't want to be in that mud fight against him. But you never know. You know, I mean, you know, I'm not that young, but I'm young enough where. Who knows? You know, and my wife may, uh, you know, she'll probably stay with me if I decide to run. I got I to figure it out with her, too. I mean, right now I'm running for re-election of my marriage, Tony. You know, and, and I could be on a one-day term for all I know. So, you know, you got to be careful. Right? Are you married? Yes. Uh, happy wife, happy life, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So I don't want to piss her off either, you know? Sure. Now, you're, you're in the political limelight. You're in the financial limelight. And usually with that comes maybe misconceptions about you and people, headlines and all kinds of things. Are there any misconceptions that you would like to address? Well, I mean, listen, I mean, I'm polarizing, you know, I mean, people, if you have a political view, then all of a sudden you get demonized and you get disfigured. Uh, you people want to attack you so that they can disfigure you or demonize you or characterize you in a certain way so that. Uh, your opinions or the things that you're saying will also be demonized. Mm -hmm. You know, so one of the greatest courses I took in law school was trial advocacy. And the professor said, if you're wrong on the facts, start attacking the person mm -hmm. because it's an ad hominem attack. And then if you do that, you might be successful in the case. And so that's what happens in politics. Um, I don't care. I think that's the more important thing. And I think you're a young guy and this is a message to all your podcast listeners. Uh, it took me a while to get here. I'm 57 years old. Mm -hmm. I don't give a shit what other people think of me. What other people think of you is none of your business. Now, when you're young, you think everybody's thinking about you and you're worried about what other people think. Sure. When you get older, you recognize they're not thinking about you. They only give a shit about themselves. And so you'd be just better off living your life being happy, have a gratitude list, uh, uh, approach life uh, aggressively, um, you know, so I don't care. I mean, I'm sure people, some people think I'm a buffoon because of what I said in the White House. Other people dislike me because I'm a New Yorker. I'm a little brash. Some people think that uh, I work for Trump, so I got to be a bad guy. Mm -hmm. Other people think I'm a, a bad guy because I left Trump and I think he's a douchebag. I don't care. I'm just going to be me. Uh, and like you said, you know, I think that's the fun thing about being a New Yorker. Yeah, absolutely. That's great advice. And I, I as I get older, I, I'm learning to uh, have have that mindset as well. Really good stuff. Um, so I want to ask, you know, how did um, you first come across Bitcoin and crypto? And what was your aha moment? 
Well, I didn't, I don't, I never, I, I, I guess I have an aha moment, but I have a gradual incremental move into Bitcoin. Mm. So my aha moment actually came in 2014. Oh, and wow. so you said, well, but what the hell, why didn't you yeah. buy the Bitcoin then? You know, obviously I would have been a genius if I did that, but <laughs> I'm not a genius. I'm an incrementalist. I'm an institutionalist. And so when the Wiggle bosses came to me to discuss Bitcoin, and the introduction of cryptocurrency that were at my conference, I said, okay, yeah, that sounds interesting. That sounds like a lot of fun. That sounds like something that could work, but it is not fully adopted yet. It's not, it's not reaching escape velocity pursuant to Metcalf's law mm -hmm. at 400. So I'll say something to you that an institutionalist would appreciate, but a big corner would probably scoff at and say that I'm late to the game. Um, I like Bitcoin better at $30,000 or $40,000 uh, than I do at $400. He said, well, what the hell's wrong with you? Why wouldn't you, you know, of course you would, I would have liked to have bought it at 400, but I didn't know that Bitcoin was going to be where it is today. I actually still think we're in very early innings for Bitcoin. Mm. So buying it under $100,000 a coin to me, I think is a huge value for people. Um, you probably read this book, if you haven't, I'll recommend it to you and your people. Uh, uh, it's Bitcoin. It's by Dominic Frisby. He's a, a British historian and economist. Uh, it's a great book. Richard Branson at the top of it. Read it and glimpse into the future. And if you you get it, this is an aha moment. You read this, you're like, aha, this is a monetary network akin to Google being a search and advertising network akin to Amazon being a retail network. Sure. This is decentralized. It's anonymous. It's crypto graphs are impregnable. Good luck trying to break them. Uh, and by the way, as your supercomputer gets pow more powerful to break them, the supercomputers in the nodes get more powerful to offset them. So good luck on all that. Um, and so for me, I'm very, very excited about the future of money. And I think the future of money is going to be decentralized. And I think it's going to be exchanged over the blockchain and if you read The Ascent of Money, look, I got all my books here for you, Tony. Look at this one. <laughs> it's another great book your people should read. It's in the wrapper. I'm going to take it out of the wrapper. Uh, I read it about six years ago. I just rebought it on Amazon because I gave it to my oldest kid. Uh, and I wanted to buy the hardcover because it's a great book by Professor Ferguson. So hmm. he's basically describing to you what the characteristics are of money. And guess what? Your life has changed as a result of technology. You're driving in a car now as opposed to a horse's carriage. You're flying in a plane right. as opposed to a train in terms of your uh, mass transportation. Or maybe you're super rich. You're flying privately on your private plane. But what do we know about money? Money is a technology. It's a tool that allows us not to have to barter with each other. Okay, And it's a way to keep score. And so what we know is that uh, if it's safe, if it's secure and people trust it, then lo and behold, it will become a bona fides. It will become a store of value or a currency. Bitcoin has all of those characteristics. And it would be natural that technology has improved so many aspects of your life. Why would it improve the money or the store of value? And oh, by the way, we have some destructive forces in the fiat currency game now. We're producing money now out of thin air and sure. we're not as cautious with it or as responsible with it as we were over the last hundred years. Since the introduction of the Fed, we are monetizing our debt. We're producing lots of M1 and M2 money supply. Money supply is up 26% in the last six months on its way up to 40 and we get the stimulus passed. Mm -hmm. So let me just stop and take a deep breath with your listeners. You're going to have 40% more dollars in circulation in the last 12 months than we had in the prior 244 years. Right. That's why this is going up. So the weird thing is your assets, like your real estate, your Mickey Mantle card, your art collection, are going up in nominal dollars. They're not going up in Bitcoin. Because hmm. Bitcoin. Bitcoin is actually more stable than people want to give it credit for because uh, it is tracing the monetization process of fiat currency. 
So this is a very big reason why you need to own some of this because it's going to be the value agent. It will be the transfer mechanism, the store of value in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a question I want to ask. And, it, you know, maybe you can take us behind a curtain since you've been in the political realms. You know, at one point, uh, Trump, when he was president, he tweeted that I'm not a fan of Bitcoin and U- U.S. dollar is still the world reserve currency, yada, yada, yada. Um, is that a stance you think that was personally from Trump or just anybody in that seat needs to make that statement because Bitcoin is a, tra- a threat to the U.S. dollar? Yeah, I think it's anybody in that seat. That would also be Bill Dudley. It's Janet Yellen. Mm. Um, you know, they have to say those things because, you know, there's FUD, fear, yeah. uncertainty, and doubt. And then there are fuddy duddies. Okay. And fuddy duddies are septuagenarians that are in the establishment, either at the Fed or Treasury or in the Washington infrastructure. And they know that the dollar has been a very powerful political mechanism and it has been a sanctioning force. They know that. Mm -hmm. And so a result of which we have to um, protect it in their minds. Now, what they also know, because they're not stupid, these are very smart economists, that that thing is growing with or without their help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're at a trillion dollars now. It's a it's the fastest scalable idea in terms of Medcalf's law adoption of any idea. It got to a trillion dollars in 12 years. You know, if you go through the other companies, 20 plus years for Google, 40 plus years for Apple, 35 or 40 years for Microsoft, all of a sudden this thing's doing it in 12 years. Uh, It's a genie that's been unleashed. You're not gonna put it back in the bottle anytime soon. And by the way, if Bitcoin wasn't invented in 2009, it would have already been invented by now. Someone would have come up with Bitcoin. Um, And there were other products like DigiCash Mm -hmm. in the, uh, you know, mid 80s into the early 90s that could have been workable. Uh, Some people think Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that may be, worked at DigiCash. Uh, But one of the issues with DigiCash, it was being controlled by a company. Uh, and your money for it to really be successful and for people to really trust it needs to be decentralized. Mm-hmm. And what do you got with Bitcoin? You have an open source cryptographic network. So, yeah, I get what I get where the policymakers are. I love that about the policymakers. So I had three criteria. You know, you said it was my aha moment. So the Winklevosses come to me. They show me this. They tell me I should buy it. I can't figure out how to buy it, and I got to mm-hmm. store it on the USB probably would have lost the goddamn thing anyway. But I said to them, well, three things have to happen. Medcav's law, this has to scale. Uh, And even though it'll be more expensive when it scales, it will be more proof in its concept. And that's something as an institutionalist, I will be happy with. The second thing that has to happen is that the regulators have to pay attention to it. Hmm. The tax authorities have to pay attention to it. And by the way, they don't have to like it, they can even be like India or China and say, yeah. no mas uh, nine on uh, on Bitcoin, no problem. But just the fact that they're opining on it means that it's become big enough where it's impregnating the whole global society. Mm-hmm. So I don't care if the regulator says yes or no, just as long as they're thinking about it, that's good enough for me. And then the third thing, which is super important to me, is storage. Mm. And we can store our Bitcoin cold storage, unplugged from the internet, at places like Fidelity, they have an insurance wrapper, their balance sheet, their name brand. I'm very comfortable with them. We have a great partnership with them. And so those three t- criteria, so we got to get going on this Bitcoin thing because it's got 1% adoption. Imagine where this thing could be at 5% adoption sure. or 8% adoption. Sure. And we're seeing a lot of companies, Tesla, MicroStrategy, Square, adding Bitcoin to their balance sheet. I recently is, is Apple going to yeah. buy Bitcoin, Tony? <laughs> That's a question I want to ask you. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know. I, I would probably, you know, I'll probably get this wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that Apple, these very large companies, they don't look at competition as much as they look at fear of governmental regulation. Mm-hmm. All these regulators are sore on Bitcoin. Would Apple be bold enough to buy it? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I don't want to say no because then sure. I'll someone will play the podcast and say, look how stupid Anthony is. <laughs> uh, but if they don't buy it, I'll understand why. But if they do buy it, I think that'll be a seismic development. It's one thing for micro strategy to buy it. 
and for Elon Musk to buy it. These are avant-garde, uh, earth-shaking entrepreneurs. Uh, Apple is now very much part of the establishment, a several trillion dollar company. If they sure. go to start moving some of that big balance sheet into Bitcoin, I think that's going to send a big signal to people. Right. So on that note, um, I, I recently interviewed the mayor of Miami. He's looking to potentially allocate some of the city's treasury reserves into Bitcoin. So mm -hmm. if you have companies doing this and you have local governments and cities and possibly central banks around the globe, yeah. What, do you see the U.S. government eventually capitulating and, look, this is going to become part of the financial structure? Well, I think you know this. Treasury owns right now Bitcoin. I don't know how much they own. Mm. Uh, I guess we could Google it. But they do own some Bitcoin. There are innovation people at the Treasury Department that have got the government long Bitcoin. Uh, will we have a digital dollar at some point? I believe that we will. If you're going to have a digital renminbi or yuan, you will probably have a digital dollar. Will that hurt Bitcoin? I believe it won't. Mm. All that will do is it'll increase the likelihood that there'll be really fantastic software on devices like this, where we can swap back and forth from coins to dollars to RENMB. You know, look out those foreign exchange places in the airports. Look out. Yeah. You're not going to have to do that anymore. You'll have it right on your phone. So the world is changing. The world's getting better. Technology has made the world better by and large. I mean, we have to deal with the carbon footprint issue. We have to deal with the clean air, clean water issue. I'm not trying to make light of that, but by sure. and large, technology has improved our living standards. It's improved our societies. And why shouldn't it be showing up in our money? Mm, agreed. And, uh, you know, yesterday, well, I, I should say maybe two days ago, we had the Tether Bitfinex settlement. And that was, of course, an element of risk that many institutional investors were looking at. And since that settled, do, do you see, OK, more folks be, on the institutional side, Wall Street side, being more willing to get involved with Bitcoin? So really good question. Um, I think that that settlement is going to dispel some of the nonsense and misinformation that's out there, right? Sure. So uh, was the moon landing faked? Okay, it wasn't, okay? I can prove that to you empirically. But there's nonsense out there that says it was. Yeah. Um, you know, did Tether affect Bitcoin? Uh, it's almost impossible for Tether to have ultimately affected Bitcoin. Did they do nefarious things with Tether and not back it with the appropriate collateral and so therefore commit financial fraud? Yes. Could it have affected Bitcoin on the margin? Possibly. But if you look at Bitcoin scale relative to Tether, it's almost economically impossible. So the fact that they've settled, they've sort of taken that whole thing out of the equation. Bitcoin's trading like water. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's moving, it's volatile. But tell you what, anything that's on the curve of Medcalf's law, where you're valuing it pursuant to this exponential growth of its network, is volatile. Let me just back that up for 30 seconds. Amazon goes public May 15th, 1997. You put $10,000 in Amazon, 24 years later, you have $21,140,000. However, you had to stomach seven periods of time where Amazon dropped 50%. Yep. So if you were a hodler of Amazon, you got rewarded because it fully executed along the curve of net Metcalf's law. But here's the cool thing about Bitcoin. This is the really cool thing. There's no CEO. Mm -hmm. There's no political intrigue in the C-suite. There's a decentralized network that's causing this scalability and causing this network effect. Um, now, as far as Skybridge's Bitcoin fund, tell us about that. Uh, how much, uh, as far as assets under management, what did you start with and where were you at today? So we have $9 billion in assets under management at Skybridge. At current market prices, we have about $550 million in Bitcoin. Our Bitcoin-specific fund, the Skybridge Bitcoin Fund, we started that with $25 million of our firm's capital. Mm -hmm. And it's now scaled in six short weeks to just under $100 million. So some of that's appreciation, but a lot of that is new asset transfer. Mm -hmm. We're taking in money every single day. Mm. We have a 75 basis point management fee structure, and we have a limited partnership structure that has a 90-day lockup to it. 
Why? Well, we wanted to uh, avoid the premiums that are being currently paid by having that daily trust in place. Can't trade the Bitcoin for the people in scale the way we would like to. You could buy it in the Grayscale Trust. They'll right. charge you 2%. In addition to the 2%, you likely will pay a 20 to 30% premium in the marketplace. Or you can buy the Bitcoin through us at NAV. You've got a 75 basis point management fee versus 2%. All that's positive. The negative, the potential negative, is that you have uh, a lockup. You know, you got to wait 90 days in our portfolio. You get sure. 60 days of holding, 30-day notice, then you can get out of it in 90 days. Now, if you're a long-term holder like me and like I'm trying to steer my clients to, it's not a big deal. Right. One of your questions should be, well, what happens when there's a D ETF? Well, I, we are open to merging or converting our private fund into an ETF mm. when the regulators are telling us that it's okay. So my message to people is, look, you can't get into an ETF now in the U.S. Right. Uh, you, can buy, you can buy into the Canadian ETF, but remember, right. they have a 40% test. You know, they have to be very, very cautious. They can only really drive Canadian investors into that ETF for it to be sustained from a regulatory perspective. But you'll eventually get an ETF codified by the SEC. We'll convert our capital base into that ETF. Then you'll have the liquidity and you'll have this instant, easy access to Bitcoin. And oh, by the way, if you're a potential investor, I want you in that before that happens, because I believe there'll be an avalanche and a cascade of demand once those products are up and running. And I'd like to get my clients in there before that, frankly. Sure. Uh, I am interviewing Hester Pierce at the SEC in a couple of weeks, and hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed, we can get an ETF approved this year. I know quite a few folks have Winklevoss swings, Bitwise, and so forth. But great to hear that you're going to, you know, do that integration. Um, you know, tell us about the type of investors you're seeing demand from, without giving names. But maybe is it like family offices? Uh, I know it's accredited as far as you know, what your website lists. But uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Ha ha happily, um, here's what I would say. I would say that. Uh, we are getting everything from college endowments, mm. pension funds, union pension funds, uh, high net worth individuals, uh, people that I would call mass affluent that are worth two, three million dollars. They want to put fifty or hundred thousand dollars in the fund. We have a fifty thousand dollar minimum, so we've got people doing that. Mm. Um, we have European banks that have expressed an interest in the fund. Wow. Uh, some of which have already invested, some of which are doing their due diligence to invest. And so it's a very eclectic mix. But remember, if you understand our history at Skybridge, we want to democratize things. So I'm trying to democratize and make accessible Bitcoin investment. Now you say, well, isn't Coinbase doing that? They are, but this is, in my opinion, a safer way to store it. Hmm. And it's a cleaner way for larger scale people to have their... Bitcoin. Moreover, you know, we're not charging high commissions to get in because we're operating at a wholesale level with the exchanges because of our size and scale. Got it. So you, it sounds like you're using multiple exchanges to execute orders and Correct. you mentioned Fidelity you're using as a custodian? Yes. Got it. Got it. Um, are there plans to add other funds, maybe Ethereum, maybe a top 10 basket, anything along those lines? That's a really good question. And so I would say, invite me back in a year, we'll have the conversation. <laughs> because what I want to do right now is I want to focus the energies of the firm purely on Bitcoin. Mm. Remember, we started out by saying that we're institutionalists. Sure. So I'm herding cats and I'm pushing on a string, Tony, to get institutionalists that are naysayers that don't see what I see mm -hmm. or perhaps what you see in Bitcoin. And so rather than stretching them into places like Ethereum or other types of coins, let's get them focused on Bitcoin. It's the largest market capitalized digital currency or store of value. And let's get them focused there. And then let's see if we can expand from there 
I'm not saying that we won't be open to it in the future, but right now I want to stay focused on where we are. Sure. That absolutely makes sense. Uh, I don't want to spread yourself too thin. Um, as To your point, Bitcoin is uh, emerging and, and that's a good place to start. Um, tell me about, you know, we're in a bull market. We could potentially see 100,000 plus, obviously, but the market's volatile. You know, what are you looking at ideally, not financial or investment advice, of course, as far as a, a, a price prediction? Okay, so I have to be careful, right? Because I don't want to sound like a lunatic. <laughs> so what I said on CNBC last week that we have a hundred thousand dollar price target for year end. Um, what was interesting about that? The anchors like Joe Kernan were aghast at oh wow, yeah. you know, it's like a lot. Uh, and then when I looked at my Twitter feed, I had all the Bitcoiners saying, "Why are you, why are you so bearish?" Right. You know, and I'm laughing at both. So I don't know what it will be. Um, but if you follow plan B or a stock to flow yeah. model, or you look at the supply that's out there and you look at the demand, which I think is overwhelming, it's going to force the price up hmm. and the price should be up. If I'm right that this technology is a better technology than gold or platinum or silver, it's portable, it's impregnable, it's easy to move around. Uh, you can move it around cleanly. 146 million people are already trusting in it on its way to a billion by 2025. Well, you know what? It should be worth a couple hundred thousand dollars a coin. So um, I don't know. You know, Plan B is at 288,000 by year end. He called 55,000 by May. Right. He got there a little earlier. It's come off from that. Bitcoin is volatile. I tell people, please be cautious. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be as long as I am on a percentage basis of your network, but you should have one or two, three percent in your exposures to Bitcoin. So, but I don't know the answer. Uh, but I would be surprised if it's not at least a hundred thousand dollars by year end. Mm. Um, and and you know we've seen to, to your point of the stock to flow model. We know the having cycle and. Usually after bull market, we go into a bear market. But this time around, you got folks who are looking to hodl long term. You know, Michael Saylor has talked about he's never going to sell and <laughs> things along those lines. And these companies putting on their balance sheet. Do you see maybe not as bad of a bear market as we saw in, in 2018, 2019, and it's more stable moving forward? Well, only because you've got this... Uh you've got these huge macro factors now. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2017, 2018, that was a retail-driven market. It was uh, a boom and bust cycle coincident with that. This has got a totally different complexity to the demand for Bitcoin in 2021. Add on what I said about mon monetary stimulus and monetary growth. You've got... 40, again, you know, $1.9 trillion stimulus coming in, there'll be 40% more dollars in production produced in supply circulating. Uh, you'd have to be crazy not to own some inflationary based hedges. I think Bitcoin sure. is one of them. Now push back on me and say, well, no, it tracks the market. You know, it was down in March of last year in the three or four thousands. Now it's at 50,000. It just tracks the market. Well, not really. Go back, take a long-term view, take a 10-year view of Bitcoin. Sure. You could put 1% of your money in Bitcoin, 99% of your money in cash over the last 10 years. And that portfolio, 1 plus 99, would have outperformed everything. Everything. Mm -hmm. Stock market, everything. And it would have done it with a high sharp ratio and very, very low volatility. So don't look at it from a short-term point of view. Mm -hmm. Listen, here is the reason why Bitcoin is meeting resistance, or one of the reasons. It sounds too good to be true. Wait a minute, I can buy this thing at 50,000, it's gonna to go to 100,000 by the end of the year? That's ridiculous. Bernie Madoff promised the rainbow, <laughs> he's been lifetime in prison. Right. But remember, this is not Bernie Madoff, it's not a money manager saying this. Right. This is a decentralized network that's scaling pursuant to Metcalf's law. 
Moreover, what else is too good to be true? The numbers I just described for Amazon, 10,000 to 21 million. Apple computer, two trillion. Look at this phone. This phone is too good to be true. I have books behind me. You know, I guess maybe I'm trying to impress you with the books that I've read, so I throw, throw them behind me. But every one of those books doesn't need to be there. They're all here in this phone. Sure. You know, we've miniaturized everything. This phone has become a Pac-Man for technological data. That book behind me or these books over here, it's a technology. What is it? It's a tool for reading. What is a technology? Tool. Technology, the understanding of tools. Technology. Okay. What is Bitcoin? It is a technological advancement in money. And so guess what it's doing pursuant to Metcalfe's law, like this phone or like Amazon. Amazon ate your hardware store. Mm -hmm. It ate your fashion store. It ate your sunglass hut. It ate your bookstore. It ate them. It's all right there in Amazon. And it's on a little tile on this phone. This phone ate your record library, yeah. your book library. It's become a radio, a movie studio. It's become a podcast machine, both to record podcasts and to listen to them. It's everything. I have done television from my phone. I've mm -hmm. set it up with a wireless internet hook and I'm on Zoom. The camera's actually pretty good and I can do television. I've created a studio where in the 1950s, it would have took yeah. two floors of the RCA building. I'm doing it right here wireless from this phone. That's Bitcoin. Bitcoin is eating and savaging the financial institutions around the world. Hmm. I want to talk a bit about uh, altcoins and some situations that are happening in the market. Um, are, are you f maybe up to speed on the Ripple XRP lawsuit from the SEC? And I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I think this is the problem with... I don't want. I just want to stop because I, I don't want to sound like an expert on these things. I'm just going to give you a common sense evaluation because I, I think I know a lot about Bitcoin and I know a reasonable amount about cryptocurrency in general, but I'm not great on altcoins. Hmm. But the Ripple situation to me is an example why Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that is, or the group that that is, was brilliant because by making it faceless and making it anonymous. No regular editor can point the gun. Moreover, by making it faceless and making it anonymous, there's no microscope on the specific read. Do you see what I mean? Sure. Or the potentiality of corruption. Yeah. Now, imagine if DigiCash made it, you know, its founder was a lunatic, and so he wasn't going to make it. But let's say he was a smarter, more reasonable guy, and he cut the deal with Microsoft that it was ordered, offered. You know, now all of a sudden that that cash is being created by a company. There's going to be inherent problems with that. Right. You know, just the, the nature of greed and the nature of corruption. So Ripple, I think, is a victim of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, how de depending on how, what the outcome is for this case is going to affect a lot of altcoins in the market. And uh, I, I'm, I have, you know, hopes that things are going to go well because Gary Gensler is coming in and he's very knowledgeable about crypto. Um, so hopefully that goes well. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. So I want to uh, switch gears a bit and talk about SALT and uh, how that came about and, and what are maybe some things we can expect this year? Uh, given I know that the pandemic, we're not in person anymore. So right now, all we're doing are these events uh, on the Internet. We have a channel. We have 12 or 13,000 people that are subscribers, but we're getting live anywhere from 10 to 80,000 people, depending on the speaker. I don't think you could do that in a live event unless we're doing it in a stadium somewhere. I don't think people would sure. even come. Right. So it's amazing that you can get this sort of scale because we're doing them globally. We're broadcasting them globally and people can pick or choose what they want and they can log on. So in some ways that's amazingly effective. Uh, the next live conference we're scheduling for September of this year. We're going to do it in New York. Right now, the Department of Health in New York says you can't do a conference. I'm hoping and praying that by September that tune will change as more and more people are vaccinated. Right. And the numbers are going lower. Hopefully, they continue to go lower. Uh, and so hopefully you'll be there. And uh, at our last conference, we had a huge crypto thing. 
Uh, and so that was uh, very good. I uh, appreciate that. So finally here, um, just some quick rapid fire questions. Uh, what's your favorite food? Everything, but I mean, I'm a <laughs> sweet eater. So if I'm about to drop dead, I'm probably eating Reese's peanut butter cups mixed into haagen ice cream. Oof. Big time <laughs> sweet eater, which is why I'll always be partially fat. Okay, that's a good question. Go ahead, go to the next one. Uh, favorite musician or band? Okay, partial Billy Joel. I'm a Long Island guy and uh, grew up with Billy Joel, and I love Billy Joel. Awesome. Um, favorite movie? Got to be The Godfather. You know, I, I mean, I, I watch a ton of movies, but The Godfather is an irreplaceable piece of art. Absolutely. Yeah, it's one of my go-tos. Um, look, you, you talked about quite a few books, but if there's one you could take off your shelf that is your go-to, what would it be? Well, there's a couple of interesting books. You know, I think that the number one book I would recommend to people is Viktor Frankl's book, The Meaning of Life. Mm. Uh, I think that's the book that everybody needs to read because what we do in our societies is that uh, we we opine that life is unfair and we act like victims often when things are not mm. going our way. Here is a man, Viktor Frankl, that survived a concentration camp. Uh, and he went on to write uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a bestseller. It was written in 1946. And I think it's probably the best book that I've ever read about the human condition and about the need for us to uh, be resilient and the need for us to be in love with life, no matter what its trials and tribulations are. And cer certainly he had his very large share of injustice uh, and man's inhumanity to man. Uh, and so I always recommend Victor's book to people. I have to add that to my list. That that sounds like a good one. Uh, finally, when you're not at Skybridge Capital, uh, what are you doing for fun as a hobby? Well, I'm actually a nerd. I mean, I'm a reader. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, you know, hang out with my kids. I ski. If it's summertime, I'm down by the beach. Because uh, I live on Long Island, so there's water everywhere. I'm on the right. boat, you know, I'm out of my house in the Hamptons. Uh, but I'm a nerd. You know, at the end of the day, like, even though I have this, like, Italian exoskeleton and I was wearing <laughs> polyester when I got started, at the end of the day, I'm probably just an intellectually curious nerd when it comes down to it, which is why I'm sitting here in between meetings reading this, getting myself further up to speed um, where the future is going. Awesome. Anthony, pleasure chatting with you. Learned great so much today. Thank You're you so much. You're a great interview, Anthony. Let's do this again, I hope. Awesome. Definitely right, in a year. Well. <laughs> All right. God bless. Take care. Bye.